Hey guys, this is John and welcome to another episode of the Meet Gistics podcast. I'm here with Austin, not the Austin most of you know, uh, but uh. a new Austin. Austin is usually my co-host for this, but he's been doing some other stuff for a while. This is going to be a bit of a weird one because A, we always start with the beer of the day, but it's a little early in the day. Technically, this was made as a chaser or mixer for whiskey in the 20s, so, so that counts. There you go. We've got some Mountain Dew and I've got some uh, grape drink mix that I pour <laughs> like three times too many into or too much <laughs> into. I absolutely love it. So that's what we're going to be sipping on the entire time. So they're actually going to get a fully sober podcast out of me, which I'm pretty sure is going to be a first. During the last <laughs> half of the first few, I don't even really remember what I was talking about. We drink. No, I'm just kidding. It's a good start. But all right. So let's first quickly, let me introduce you to them. Okay. And then we're going to get into your story, how you started the company, all of that. Okay. okay. So I met him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were doing a, a CCH class here in Kansas. We have constitutional carry. So you can carry concealed, open carry, no problem. But if you want reciprocity when you go to neighboring states, you have to have your license. So or to skip the background checks. Which when the guy was asking, hey, why is everyone taking this? Mine was reciprocity. I heard in the back, I want to buy guns easier. I was like, okay, we like that person. Uh, and then when we went out to shoot, uh, he and I kind of started laughing about how easy the qualification was. I mean, it was... I was laughing at you for reloading so much. <laughs> so I have a, a single stack uh, that's a uh, eight mag and seven mag. And we had to shoot 25 rounds, something yep. like that. Some, so I don't even know if you, did you switch mags even? Mm -mm. Yeah. Okay. So he switched yeah. mags, but I'm having to stop. Not only that, but I only brought two mags with me. So I had to reload one of them. And he's like, are you having gun problems? I was like, no, single stack. Uh, but I, I mean, I think I have kind of small hands, so it just fits around my hand easier, but I just know that the kid that was with me uh -huh. is, is Michael Maines. And I've shot with this kid for forever, played baseball together for years. And both of us practice at like 50 yards with a handgun, like 30 to 50 yards. Right. So that's where we're used to shooting. We get to seven yards at the farthest. And it's like, are we, we do speed drills at this range. Like, uh, okay, we got all the time we want. Cool. I kind of so we mag dumped. <laughs> I actually I literally forgot to aim at yeah. the first two because you're so close. You're just like, eh, yeah, you absolutely don't need to aim. So that test is stupid and pointless for anyone who's shot more than once. The test that was anyone. not graded. Yeah, he's just like, yep, you pass. I'm like, what? You didn't even look. But uh, the whole deal was you had to hit 18 of 25, and the furthest away you got was seven yards. So absolutely. I, I'd be shocked if anyone did not pass. I that. should have done it left-handed. <laughs> Probably could have, yeah, could have got some work in. Yeah, yeah, good test at least. Instead of wasting nine millimeter. So then we're walking away. Yeah, and we had talked about that uh, nine millimeter is so hard to find right now that we're like, maybe I'm just going to shoot eighteen shots. But whatever. I think I ended up shooting all twenty-five. Uh, but as we're walking away from that, you said, "Hey, uh, you know, do you know London?" I'm like, yeah, London works for me. And so we started talking about that. Turns out I had heard of you. Uh, yeah. You're known as Tree Guy, <laughs> Austin Tree Guy. Um, but we started talking about getting a deer. We kept in touch. So let's get into why you always have access of access to deer. Uh, so see, it would have been my freshman year of college. Uh, we had like a school grant that they were doing and it was like for 2,500 bucks or something. But it was if you could show them a business model for like a small business mm -hmm. and prove that it could make money, then you presented it. And if you won, you got 2,500 bucks to put into a business. So I made a hunting show and I had Trevor Haycock, kid I played baseball with on it. And then Chase Johnson, who was uh, at the time supposed to be my brother-in-law. Okay. And then no, that's a long story. <laughs> and then uh, I had somebody else on there, but I had like a group of five guys. Okay. And that was our outfitters or pro staff. And then we ended up, we didn't win it, but I went home and I was just smarting off to my dad. And then he uh, made the comment, well, if you're going to have a TV show, you got to have a theme song. Okay, dad. I had just come off stand. So London actually has been trying to steal this video from me for months. 
because it's blackmail and it's never going to happen. But <laughs> I'm like face paint and baby faced. And I wrote a hunting song in like 15 minutes and it's 45 seconds long. But sure. I was like, that's good enough for opening credits of a TV show right there. We're good to go. And then I didn't do anything with it after that for four years mm -hmm. just because I was doing everything else. And then I ended up uh, buying 80 acres and that is expensive. <laughs> that is not cheap and it's not fun, but uh, it's a piece of ground we'd hunted for forever. And the guy was going to sell it to the neighbor if I didn't buy it. And I didn't like that neighbor. So we bought that and I decided to start outfitting it to pay for it. Right. And then once it was over, I could just stop outfitting it and then I have my ground. Sure. Then I found out I'm actually kind of good at this. And it's fun <laughs> because not only do I get to kill a deer, all the other deer that I want to touch, uh -huh. somebody else kills it and I get to hold it at some point. So <laughs> that's, it's fun for me. Yeah. I enjoy it. And then I've taken, we had three guys in so far this year, two out of three killed or no, sorry, three out of four, uh, had one go down. That was a 172. Um, I actually passed 170 inch deer this year and cried inside that's that's the evil. why why do we pass it because he's young okay and i don't want to shoot a young deer fair enough and i shot a six and a half year old deer and it's by no means the same oh. he's 147 inches the day after i pass 170 inch deer <laughs> uh, that was rough and i know my dad if he goes and hunts down there he's gonna shoot that deer first chance he gets <laughs> So, so you feel like there's a there's a difference between the ethics of you and your father. So my dad has a 226 inch deer. Okay, from Kansas. Mm -hmm. okay. From half a mile from our house. Wow. But it was a fluke deal that we saw a wounded deer and got permission from the landowner, and dad got to put the deer down. Okay. That doesn't happen. No. So the next biggest deer my dad has is probably 155, 60 inches. And I've never scored him, but I'm I'm guessing he's about there. And he's gun hunted most of his life. He bow hunted a long time ago. I actually got him back into bow hunting. And since then, I think the the biggest one he's killed with a crossbow, because he didn't actually kill one with his bow. I mean, he's almost 70 now. Okay. So he's he his shoulders are really, really bad. Um, I think the biggest one he's killed is like 139. And so 170 inch deer. Yeah. Even if he's gun hunting, that that's dead all day right and never thinking twice so kind of hoping my dad doesn't see that deer what's your biggest <laughs> uh 179 okay yeah uh, gross was that on I your 80 know. acres no that was on a piece of ground that i wasn't supposed to kill a deer on <laughs> uh i it was like the second day of season and i went because i just wanted to get in the woods get a sit under and just chill mm -hmm. and i didn't expect to see a deer i was in a gun stand and it, it sits funky on that property, but it's a quarter and it's all ag except for just a corner of trees. Okay. I was on the point of the corner and it it's there to ob, like an observation stand. And the guy next to me pulled hay and bumped this deer out and it ran through and I shot him at three yards and then I shot him again at 30 yards and then watched him pile up and it was just like, what just happened? <laughs> and then I called my buddy like, dude, I need help. Reflex. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I called Trevor and I was like, dude, I need help dragging a deer. Oh, bullshit. No, like, I really need help dragging a deer. No, you don't. And he hung up on me. <laughs> so I called him back like, dude, I'm literally <laughs> looking at the deer. I'm going to need help moving this thing. So he shows up and he was like, dude, if I come down there and there's no deer, I'm going to kick. You know, I'm going to hurt you. So it was kind of funny. But I'd never seen the deer before. The, the outfitters that are around me hadn't seen him. He just showed up yeah and it was the weirdest thing ever but I, he's gonna be the first one that i mount out of my deer once i know how to do it so, so I've, I've got do some, all that yourself yeah okay I'm, I'm learning how to do it uh i haven't gotten enough time set apart to actually go and study right i've got a guy in hutch uh, larry kirshner he's supposed to teach me um and he's actually a really really good taxidermist so if anybody doesn't know about larry what's he his, is full time now what's his what's the name i of his think place? it's just kirshner taxidermy okay uh larry kirshner taxidermy um he's over on the east side of hutch but he was working for like not alcoa but something like that i can't remember where he worked in hutch but he just retired and now he's full time on his own and he's got i think three guys working for him now wow like he's cranking them yeah it's not much of a retirement is it 
yeah, he's he's good at it. Yeah. He's very, very good. Yeah, that definitely is more a uh, skill than a uh, well, more art than yeah. science. I mean, it really does. I love going on to Instagram or something and just getting watching into, how they do it. Well, no, I love the bad ones. Oh. I love looking at the fails. It is so much. My favorite one of all time is a fox that oh, somebody is that the one that's like, yes, just clearly either I've seen it. it was their first attempt or they had no idea what they were doing or they were intentionally making it. It looked like it was the wrong size of mannequin it, and they just yep. like stretched it. The face was the wrong shape almost. Yeah. It's like got one point out. It's absolutely terrible, but tons of fun for us to look at. Okay. So you've got 80 acres. It's all yours, mm -hmm. but you have access to a lot more land. Yep. So I've got uh, 200. Right now, there's 240 acres in Reno County um, plus my 80. So that's 320. Uh, there's two quarter, three quarters. So that's 480 on top of 320. So about 800 acres there. Okay. And we're, if it goes correctly, we're going to get another three or 4,000. Um, I just have to talk everybody into it. Sure. Which we'll see. Uh, I think we're going to end up forking some money on that one. But then we got 160 acres in Harper County. And then in Butler County, I got a hold of 8,000 acres there. Yeah. But I haven't gotten to really do anything with it this year. Okay. Just because we were so behind on everything else yep. so end of this month i'm going to go out there and start knowing where the deer are now so the next year we're already ready for what yep. they're going to do um i mean it's eight thousand acres and not all of it's deer ground okay but all of it has deer on it so there's probably only about half of it will really hunt hard mm -hmm. and then in missouri northern missouri we're working on getting two thousand acres out there that way, when I have the people who call me last minute and didn't draw for Kansas, mm -hmm. they're like, hey, I want to come hunt. And I keep having to tell them, well, you're, you're about eight months behind. Right. Uh, I can send them to Missouri. Okay. And over there, it's over the counter. So I can get them in over there just right as long away. as I got spots. Sure. Hey. So we'll see if that one goes through. It's going to be kind of harder doing that one because I'm going to have to have somebody out there to run – Hunters back and forth, or I right. have to figure out like an unguided situation out there, which will be. Do you have a plan? Like, so a lot of your hunts are multi day. Yeah, five like days. Here, I, do you have cabins? Where do you. Uh, right now, uh, we had everybody staying at my parents' house. Okay. So my dad is retired, and he's the one that does um, all the grunt work for me, getting guys back and forth and feeding them. Sure. And then when they kill a deer, I take care of the caping, I take care of taxidermy prep. Um, the only thing dad really does on that is he'll probably gut it for him to get it back to the house. And right. then when I get off work, I boogie out Take there. care of the rest. Because unfortunately, I still have to have a job. Yeah, we're going to get to that. It's not fun. Yeah. But uh, that's how we've kind of run it so far. We're going to end up, uh, the original plan was to build a cabin on 80 and keep everybody out there. But the time frame that it's going to take to do it, I don't think I can get it done before the end of the year. Sure. So... For next year, we're probably going to build a cabin at my dad's place because um, we've got a spot where we can put it and we've got power, water, and electric. Right, right and there. It's, sure. it's yep. right there. So we're going to end up throwing one there. That way we've got more room for guys because right now it's like four and that's it. I mean, four is stretching it. Your max. Eh? And I'm going to make it to where we can hold about eight guys at a time. Okay. I will never have eight guys at a time, but I'm going to have room for eight. Okay. But... So London has shown me quite a few or quite a bit of your trail cam. Oh, I got a weird one this morning. Okay. It's a, it's a stag. It, okay. So I don't know how the genetics of this works right. or the science yeah, of it, yeah. but my dad killed one of these things in like 98 where it's, I don't know if it's born without testicles or if it's just a uh, testosterone issue okay but they don't ever shed their velvet so they just grow these gnarly nasty gross horns and the year my dad shot one there was a set of triplets and he's got one mounted i got one on a camera this morning oh wow because i was scrolling through and it was actually the stand we hunted out of it was there yesterday at three o'clock and i was just like what the hell is that you know you could have canceled on us well I, you could i'll be back out there this okay. afternoon but i was sitting there going like if that I'm if you sure miss that, that you're, <laughs> yeah, you're never going to forgive yourself. You miss that. I just want to see it. Yeah. 
because that'd be cool as hell. But we're we're hunting out on my grandpa's ground, and it's it's less about us killing a deer as opposed to we're just trying to see where we're at. Right. Because for the last ten years, that ground's just been raped. And that's where I'm trying to get, or where, where I was trying to get to is. You have on your property, the 80 acres and wherever else you have your trail cams, you seem to have a very high quality mm-hmm. bucks out there. Or, or I, maybe I'm only, you know, getting shown the best ones, but I'm seeing a lot well, of yeah. really good ones. I don't what do show you, you small deer. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing to draw those in, keep them there? You know, it's... And you don't have to give up any trade secrets. just the, the ground itself. Okay. So that 80... Um, West of me and east of me, I've got a guy that owns like 800 acres total, 700 something. And he's all around me. And he leases the 80 south of me. And he's the guy that tried to buy the 80 out from under me, okay. which cost me 30 grand extra. Oh. But, um, and they shoot big deer. And then there's a quarter north of me um, that has, it's not the family that hunts it, but there's other people who hunt it. And I've I've gotten to be friends with them. And we're all on the same page of, we're trying to kill bigger deer. Uh-huh. You know, it's not a 130 inch deer stab it and be done. Right. It's we're trying to kill five year old deer or older that are their studs. That's just what we're after. Um, where I passed up that 170 inch deer, um, we have almost a half section there. The east half section isn't really hunted all that much, and I'm going to shell out a lot of money to get the other half section next year because I guarantee I will kill 180 inch deer on opening day. Okay. Which I'll be sick for the rest of the year, but it's 180 inch deer and I'm not going to complain. Sure. But uh, there's an outfitter there, uh, which is Ben Oaks, and I'm good friends with him now. He's in the same boat. Like we were talking to each other over the summer. Um, and it actually was kind of funny. Our friendship started via our hatred for our neighbor. <laughs> Uh, I was down there, I was setting a stand and I was watching the deer that I shot, uh, the one I passed up. And then there was another like seven year old deer. I mean, he's just ancient, big sway back had a big drop time on one side. And I was watching these deer all summer. I mean, every day, like clockwork, if I could have hunted the property next to me, I would have killed any one of those deer on opening day because they were just there. Okay. Problem was the way the ground lays and the way the ag lays, they were coming out on the opposite property, crossing into an 80 that I don't have permission on, and then coming down to me. And then the soybeans dried out and they stopped coming in that that pattern. Right. So opening of season comes and I don't have any deer down there anymore. Um, but I went out there one day and I was watching these deer and I'm looking at a tree going, that don't look right. That that something's different. That looks like a camera. Or, or something or uh-huh. a sign. I ended up going over there. There's a camera and it's on the fence post facing into us. And I thought this jackass over here has 300 acres and he's going to put a camera in the corner of us. Not even in him. It, right. It's literally on us with corn pile out in our field. Seriously? Uh, so I took his camera down and just put it on the ground. <laughs> now that's your warning. Yeah. I go back, camera's back on the post. That's mine. <laughs> So I took the camera and then, I don't know, like four days later, I go back down there and I'm watching this corner again and I'm looking going, there's something in the soybeans. And he had driven a post and put a camera on it now in another guy's field. So not only was he doing it on mine, now he's doing it on my neighbors who I know he can't hunt on Uh, and he couldn't hunt on me. So I'm going, you're bold. uh, So I call the farmer. Farmer gets a hold of the landowner. Landowner gets and told me, and I go, dude, do you got a camera down here? Because I have never seen you guys deer hunt this ever. He goes, no. So, okay, before I took it down, I just wanted to make sure, but this is the second time this has happened. So he comes down there, meets me down there. We go down, see the camera. I didn't put that there. Okay, so I left a note on the post, said to call my number because you don't have permission here. And took that camera too. (laughs) So it's like, I don't know, two or three days later, I get a phone call and it's Ben Oaks. And it was a weird miscommunication with the owner of that 80 that he had permission to muzzleload, kind of, but not really, and just thought he did. Okay. And I ended up giving him his cameras back, and he thought, man, I was about to come down there and just wreak havoc because I thought that asshole was stealing my stuff. 
And I was like, well, I thought it was that guy putting them on me. So we ended up being good friends because we don't like that guy. Yeah, well, there you go. Friendship <laughs> forged in hatred can be yeah. very strong. You guys have a common enemy and few things will bond people together yeah. better than somebody yeah. else to hate on. But he, he was one of the ones over the summer that um, they hunt all around me over there. And he was going, dude, if this deer makes it one more year, he's going to be a freak. And I was like, well, I, I agree with you, but... I know how many clients you bring in. <laughs> so are you going to tell them no? Right. He said, we're not going to shoot that deer. Oof. And I said, okay. And then next year it's? It's free game next okay. year. Okay. We, we decided which deer we're going to get shot in that little conversation. Oof. And we've stuck to it. Man. We've both sent each other videos of that deer under the stand. Like, I didn't kill him. <laughs> that's that's as good as I can do for He's you. just begging for it, though. Oh, he did. Yeah. He stood under me for 15 minutes <laughs> at 30 yards. And I'm just crying. Oh, I hated my life. And then he finally left. And the next day, uh, the one I shot, which was just a bully buck down there, I rattled that deer in in October, like beginning of October. Okay. That shouldn't happen. But he come in, come into the feeder, and I was just like, okay, here we go. And I ended up being drawn on that deer for three minutes. Oof. I've got it all on video. What do you pull? Uh, so I've got a turbo cam. I'm drawing 60 seven or eight pounds okay but it's like 70 percent let off with a jumpy cam so it's just like please just step forward <laughs> and he wouldn't he just stood there on that leg and then he stood up and like posted on it and stood there for another like 30 seconds and finally i was just like i gotta let it go yeah it was 18 yards so i was fairly confident i could hug the shoulder then i made a bad shot and never shot him but i had to shoot him again yeah you got him Tell the story of uh, your feeder oh. <laughs> from the other day. Uh, so the deer that I brought in to uh, have them butcher for us. Oh, um, wait, hold on a second. We should say that real quick. We didn't cover that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we'll have a video. It's probably out by the time you're listening to this. Go over to our YouTube page. Awesome was nice enough to bring in a deer. We had Kurt Ratzliff from BHA come in, uh, do some basic butchering. Then we brought it into the processing room, talked a little bit about the roasts, what to do with certain cuts. Um, we know that's going to be a lot of people's first times handling a deer this year. A, we have a lot of new hunters and B, a lot of processing places are not taking deer this year. So we wanted something to help people get at least started with the basics of it. Okay. Back to the- That actually turned out to be a really good day at work too. I didn't have to do anything. Nothing? I did one install. It's great. <laughs> So, okay. So you, you do this, which sounds like it's a full-time job at least. Yeah. Um, and then you also do a job installing satellite internet, basically. Yes. Kind of. Kind of. So I do this and then my main job that pays for everything is, uh, technically for velocity internet out of El Dorado and it's, um, direct wireless. So we have radio towers that they've built mm. everywhere. And then I go up onto like the peaks of houses um, and mount a J-arm and a radio and I have to align it with a tower and then run it in for your internet. Okay. And so it's just picking it up from that tower. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the new ones are a lot like a cell phone. They've, they've got SIM cards in them. Um, they're, they're pretty cool. The only downside uh, of the new radios that we found instead of the old ones, the old ones had to have like straight line of sight or you couldn't get anything. Mm -hmm. So if you had a tree limb in the way, just killed your signal. These ones, I can shoot through trees for miles, but if I have a hill in the way, zero. Yeah. It, it's weird. But well, I mean, that it, does make some sense. Trying to get through ground is a lot harder than trying to get through a tree. I, yeah, I, it was the funkiest thing ever. I mean, I di we didn't get to do a whole lot of training with it because they're really new and they're, they got uh, some funding through the CARES Act and they're trying to catch up to, to not have to pay that back. Sure. And so we've been under the gun kind of getting things done. And the first real day that I got to see one, I'm standing on a roof shooting through trees and I can't see what I'm looking at. And the tower was seven miles. We turned around to a tower at one mile, but it was just over a hill. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And we were looking at each other like, you can't be serious. It's cool, but at the same time. Yeah. Really? But uh, yeah, no, that... Uh, that deer, um, I actually was taking Dalton up there to hunt, and he works with me okay. at, at uh, Velocity. And 
we're going in and I changed the plan like on the way in. Like we got out of the truck and I said, you're going to that stand. You're going to get in before daylight. Just get there. And he, well, I don't know where that tree's at. Just follow the mode path, man. That's all you got. You'll do. find it. Because he did, he wasn't there when we set that stand, so he's guessing. Mm -hmm. So he finds the stand, and I got so many more details from him getting into the tree okay. that I didn't get before. So I set that stand, and I had never gone back and like touched it up. And I set it in, God, I want to say like July. Like I set it a long time ago. So I didn't go back in and trim the limbs that have grown and stuff like that. So I guess going into the tree. He's climbing up with his backpack on his chest and his crossbow on his back because mm -hmm. he's got this double sling for it. And he's like crawling through and he's got his phone sitting here for a flashlight because he can't see in the dark for nothing. <laughs> and I guess he got like two steps from the, the stand and his phone went boom. Oh. And it landed with the, can or the, the light down. Okay. So he just sat there. <laughs> nothing. And he's like, I ain't going down. Uh -huh. So he, he gets into the tree. I guess he's just cussing me because <laughs> he's, you know, fighting with tree limbs and stuff that were in the way because I hadn't gone back and trimmed it. And so he gets in the stand and I'm texting him because I'm like, did you find it? All right. Because I knew where I was. Oh, going. that's why he wasn't responding. Yeah. Oh, so okay. he's not answering me. I'm like, this, what are you doing? Yeah. So it gets to like eight o'clock and I text him again like, dude, are you dead? <laughs> Something. And he texts me back and he goes, good news and bad news. Okay, what'd you see and what'd you miss? Because that's the first thing that comes to mind because mm -hmm. dad had already missed a deer up there. We'd already had uh, a lady hunter up there hit one really high in the back straps and it just par for the course, he would have missed one. And he goes, well, I didn't miss, but oh, you fear. <laughs> what? And then the next picture I get, and I'm going to have to get you guys this picture so yeah, you yeah, put it on sure. here, is just my feeder laying on the ground with the deer laying 20 yards behind it. And I'm just crying in the in the stand. That was the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And he's like, I get over there and he's apologizing. I'm like, dude, that's the funniest thing. What are you going to do? Like, well, but it, explain, because I initially thought he shot through the feeder to get to the deer. So I guess um, for, for once, the deer did exactly what they were supposed to do. Okay. It came straight across the spot in the fence, walked yeah, yeah. straight to the feeder, and he let it walk under the feeder and then shot it instead of shooting it out in the ring of corn around. Right. So it's underneath of it. He shoots it. It jumps, takes the feeder out and just mash the legs flat and crack the plastic. Yeah, it was ruined. We got it back up. Yes. We, we bent her up, put a little tape on it. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It'll last another month. Okay. <laughs> Up in the morning with the rising sun, gonna hunt all day till the season's done. Up that tree and sleet and rain, gotta sit all day, gotta take that pain. Going up the tree with a stick and string, old smoke pole, make an ice ring. Going after elk and them big old bucks in the same old woods where the turkeys cluck. Kinetic connection outdoors. Kinetic connection outdoors. That's awesome, man. That is absolutely <laughs> great. That is the first time anyone's ever done any musical on here, but that was absolutely phenomenal. That was the uh, intro to your show. Mm -hmm. So you've got a bunch of guys out there. Say you have, you're doing four is your tops right mm -hmm. now. Do you guys do like sitting out at night around well, campfires? For, I haven't gotten to be there for a lot of it just because I've been working. So... Uh, <laughs> Like I had my Louisiana guy in and I got to see him twice just because. And that how was long when was I he had, here? Yeah. That or was how? when I had just, or he was here for uh, five days. Five days. Okay. Um, I had just started the new job and I didn't get to go down there much. I got to see him the day he came in. Um, and then I came back, I guess I saw him three times. I came back to check cameras twice. Okay. So there was a couple nights where it was like three in the morning when I got home and then I was back up at five. But I'm working out of El Dorado, and that's an hour and a half 
uh, from over there. So it was long, long, long night. So you need to make your business grow more. You need people that you can just trust to well, take care of all that. So next year, um, I got hooked up Here, with Tacticam. It'll sit right there okay. once it sits. Um, so Tacticam, uh, I got set up as a dealer for them and I will end up getting probably 80 of their cell cams, their new reveals next year. And that's how I'm going to run all the trail cameras. Okay. And I'm just going to put them all onto a solar charger. So I don't have to jack with them again. And then I can leave those for months and that'll save me so much running and gunning. Sure. And then on the feeders, um, with the throwers that we have now and how we've got them set up, I can run those for over a month without having to service okay. them as long as the batteries stay So that's up. good. Yeah. So that'll save me quite a bit of time. And then the stands and whatnot, the only problem I had was every time we got new ground, I had to divert all the attention to the new ground and then spend, you know, three weeks learning the deer, patterning deer, setting stands, setting cameras, mm -hmm. setting feeders, and then leaving it to go do it again on another one. But next year, I already have an idea where the deer are. I shouldn't have to do that. So at some point, we'll end up having enough of it established that it won't be like it was this year. But this year was rough. It was a lot of running and gunning. But you almost certainly are going to have more land next year. Yeah. Right? I yeah. mean, so I, I know right we will. It's just position. a matter of how many acres. Okay. Um, but the fun part is the more people that come and hunt, the more money I have out of it. So the less extra work I have to do. Fair enough. And so last summer I was doing, uh, I was still running heavy equipment, uh, for the township at Langdon. I was umpiring like college baseball down to 10 U baseball. Okay. So I was doing that five days a week. That was my evenings. And then on top of that, when I had the time or we didn't have ball games, I was going and playing music at like Wichita Union Stockyards and Emporia and places like that. And then trying to learn taxidermy and all my other little stuff, Ugh. like teaching uh, swing dancers and stuff like that. It Your was, life sounds exhausting. It's not fun. <laughs> there, there, are, there are days where I do not enjoy it. But now that I'm, I doubled what I was making at the township when I switched jobs. Okay. So I don't have to do as many of the other things to make up that Right. Gap. So I've got a lot more time now. And the like the 8,000 acres here in Butler, I wasn't close enough to it to just go in the evening. Now I'm 30 minutes away. Okay. So throughout the summer, I can get that place set. It, it won't be near as much of a hassle. Last year, it was just, there was a lot to do. And go, go, go. I was getting four hours a week to do it in. That's not great. Because it was... You know, eight o'clock to four o'clock at the township. And then that's typically without a lunch because you're in a machine. So right. you just go yep. through it, get off at four, jump in the truck, drive to Wichita or actually Goddard. And then you're on a ball field from 530 until 1030 or 11. And then it's another hour home and then you do it again. Yeah. And that was like Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <sighs> And then I think it was Tuesdays and Sundays we didn't have games. It sucked. Yeah. Sounds like it. But you mentioned you played – Were you uh, the, everyone you said you were playing baseball with, was that in college? Uh, so I played college ball. I got to play some independent ball. Okay. Um, I've, I'm a small kid. I came from a 1A school. We don't play pro ball. <laughs> we're too small. I was 185 pounds at my peak. What did you play? Uh, I was a pitcher and middle okay. infielder. Yeah. And when I got to college, they hated the way I threw because I was a sidearm guy. Yeah, they tried to so fix you. So they wouldn't let me play the field and they wouldn't let me hit because I was a pitcher. <laughs> but like McPherson College and Trevor Haycock can attest to this, I was one of our better hitters and they wouldn't let me hit. <laughs> and I, I was, if not the fastest, the only kid on the team that could touch me was, um, I want to say his name was like Derek, not Derek Carr, but something Carr. His last name was Carr. Uh, he was a, a black kid from Texas, I think. Uh, real tall, lanky. He was a pitcher too. Okay. I could outrun all of our guys on the bases, but I wasn't allowed to run bases. <laughs> it, it made no sense. Yeah, that's got to be frustrating. And our, and our coach, I remember uh, we played at Wiley College, and I steal signs. 
Like I'm, I'm good at it. You can, yep. And if you're stupid enough to let me steal it, I'm gonna steal it. Mm -hmm. I stole this team's signs, and I, I picked up what this pitcher was doing because he was tipping pitches, and it was just real minute things. But I would notice like an elbow change when he's set if he's doing a certain pitch, or his wrist angle at the edge of his glove on okay. a certain pitch. Like I just, I was picking that stuff up, and I went and told my coach. I was like, hey, you need to tell everybody this is what this pitcher's doing. I'm right 100% of the time. He's only got three pitches, and I know which I know two out of the three, and that singles out the third. Right. And he's like, well, you need to tell your guys. Well, that's the problem. You told all your guys that pitchers are only pitchers, and they're not athletes, so they don't listen. So you should probably tell them so they can <laughs> hit this guy. And so I went and told Trevor, and I was like, dude, if he does this, it's a curveball. Really? I said, yeah, just crush it. Hits a three-run bomb. Nice. Just first first shot out of the blocks. And I'm sitting there in the dugout like, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> so, all right, you play baseball from a young age? Oh, yeah. Hunt from a young age? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you've been trained for what you're doing <laughs> yeah. since. When I was in, like, grade school, I remember we'd do, and this is back on, like, those old school, like, giant computers. We'd do PowerPoint when yeah, it was yeah. new. And uh, I remember we had to do, like, presentations on what you wanted to do. I remember like killing deer was my Up career there. plan <laughs> and everybody like laughed at me over it. But I had like slideshow presentations with all these pictures of big deer. Like that's going to be on my wall. <laughs> this is how you do it. Yeah. I mean, there are tons, there are thousands of people across probably just the Midwest who make a living yeah. doing this. So you definitely seem like you have the the get up and go for it. I mean, oh, you've yeah. been working nonstop for a couple of years at this. You've got the most important, uh, you've got a very important part of this where you've got your own land, plus you have good enough relationships with other people to have access to more land mm -hmm. and you have a clientele. Yeah, it's it's been fun. Um, like working the job that I do now, I have to go and interact with a lot of people and which they'll yell at you because of the COVID stuff out there, but they're all rednecks and they don't care. <laughs> but, um, you talk to people and a lot of it's leased up already. I mean, there's, there's some big money that gets thrown over there, Yeah. but just talking to people, I've gotten permission on three or four different places from going while and installing, installing internet. That's awesome. And like Dalton, um, he just doesn't get it. And he gets mad at me because I'll text him or call him while we're at work. Cause we call each other all the time at work. And I'll be like, dude, I just got us another 200 acres we can go hunt on. How? Because I asked. Yeah. Uh, I don't, what do you want from me? Nope. I asked. Yep. Nope. And he's like, well, every time I ask, they get mad. I said, well, you're not asking. <laughs> you're not right. Exactly. <laughs> so you're doing something wrong. Figure it out and get better at it. <laughs> um, Kinetic Connection Outdoors. Interesting name. What, what is behind that? Uh, there isn't another one. Okay. That was my biggest thing. Interesting. Okay. So I came up with the name the same night we made like the business plan. And I was trying to think of like, obviously I wanted outdoors in it because that's cliche, but yeah, I got to have it. it. Is. Yep. And so my brother and my dad back in the day had talked about doing this and it was supposed to be like Smith's Outdoor Services. And it was going to be a big like SOS type thing. Ooh, that's but I was crazy. like, do you know how many companies mm. are SOS? Yep. And if you do Smith's Outdoor Services, you can't do like SOS Outdoors because then you have Smith Outdoor Services Outdoors. You're right. You know, it just it just didn't flow. So I and I couldn't come up with a logo for it either because there are so many logos with SOS that you can't copyright one. Sure. So I was sitting there like, all right, kinetic energy, and it's connecting with something. We're connecting to the outdoors. That's what we're going to go with. Yeah. This was at three a.m. on like a Saturday morning. That's what we went with. Well, and plus it stuck. The, the connection, like the connection to the deer, you have the kinetic energy of the bow or of the arrow. Right. I mean, it it works on numerous levels. The honestly. only downside is people can't remember it. <laughs> um, and if you tell somebody like the name of it, uh -huh. they have no idea what the first word is because it's not a word that comes up. Yes. So people are, uh, huh? Uh, what now? Can you spell that for me? <laughs> so you have to spell it a lot, but. Here's the good thing, though. They don't even need to get the outdoors. If you just type in kinetic connection, your website is the number one or return. Yeah, it's so the only one. That's great. I mean, that is big. And the other thing that I came up with was I could come up with a logo 
the logo for that was a three minute like That'll work. So we're going to post links to all of this, um, but the logo is the K is out of arrows. Uh, the C is two deer antlers and the O is a scope. I mean, that's it's pretty awesome. And it was simple. Really? Yeah. I drew it on a piece of paper and sent it to a friend of mine in Texas who knows how to like, I, I don't know what you even call it, yeah, do yeah. the graphic sure. design stuff yep. of it. Yep. And I was like, can you make this for me? Yeah. Cool. And then it was like three weeks, so I hadn't got one back yet. So I went on to clip art on yep, like a Word document. Yeah, yeah. And I found like something close, and I was trying to like piece layers of clip art to make them work. Uh -huh. And I finally got it kind of close, and I like sent it to a couple of people. Like, can anybody like Fix actually this. make this right, into yeah. a JPEG? Because right now it's 50 layers of stuff. <laughs> and so I, my friend in Texas ended up did, she sent me back one and that's been the one I've used for the most part. And there's actually, there's an apparel shop on there that is actually going to go away. Okay. Because that is a pain to run. I am not smart enough to run one of those things. Okay. Uh, it worked for the most part until one person got a shirt with, it was like a razorback tee and one side was like that wide and the other side was about as wide as my thumb. Uh. And then I had somebody order a hat. And the hat ended up costing me like 10 bucks because they charged shipping like three times and it made no sense. We'll talk after. I'll get it just <laughs> if you want, I'll get you in touch with the guy who does all of our stuff. Like we're super happy with him. Well, if he wants to hook me up. So yeah, yeah, we'll <laughs> definitely get you in touch with him. Um, if not, I actually, I, I know another guy, he's far away, but first job I ever had was uh, t-shirt printing. Oh, good. And love that guy. Absolutely adore him. So I've got two people. If you if you want to continue it, I can get you in touch with good people. At least. All right. If somebody wants to wear it, you just you just go ahead. All right. But let's talk more about your website. Okay. So all we've done is talk about deer hunting up to this point, but you also do upland, turkey, and waterfowl. Mm -hmm. So the upland hunting is, I don't have a dog for it technically. Okay. Uh, I'm working on getting a dog. He'll be here next fall. And then the turkey hunting is unguided. Because you really don't need a guide yep. to kill turkeys out here. Yep. Um, I've never once gone turkey hunting to kill a turkey. Like I've gone deer hunting and then killed a turkey <laughs> right. because I was bored and sure. felt like killing a turkey. Yeah, it, yeah. It's ridiculous. I've had one person come strictly to turkey hunt. And the fact that he didn't kill one the first morning, Ooh. I was just like, what did, where where did you go? <laughs> He's like, well, I went over here. No. No, just just go back where we hunt for deer. Right. Kills a turkey yeah, in yeah. like 30 minutes. It was dumb. And I've got, I have a video. I'll have to get it for you. I have 14 long beards in one video walking in the same direction. Oh. And you're just staring at it like, really? <laughs> this is easy. Yeah, it's, I mean, they're, every one of them had 10 inch beards. It, so it's just dumb. We do some stuff with uh, National Wild Turkey Federation and we've had uh, their Kansas... I think he's Kansas and Oklahoma representative. Um, but we've had him on here twice. The last time he brought his son, his son, first turkey he ever killed was a double beard. There you go. First one. Just, I've only ever seen one. That Yeah, that's the and same I, thing with I him. didn't shoot it, right. but I was just like, that's funky. Yeah. I've seen a picture of one that had like 13 beards. Really? It was just like different huh. spots. It was weird. Just a weird mutation. But they had it like spread out on a on a board and had them all like taped down with a number. It was cool. Huh. I almost thought Never. it was like, well, it's more like two beers with a bunch of random right, beers, yeah. but Some bumps or whatever. Um, and then waterfowl. Yeah. So the waterfowl, um, I don't know squat about waterfowl hunting. Tomorrow will be technically my first legitimate waterfowl hunt. Okay. Because my dad raised me to waterfowl hunt the way he does, and we puddle jump. <laughs> okay. We we ha we find birds, we crawl up on them, we jump them, we shoot them. Yeah. It's not hard. There's no setting. No. no. It, yeah. it, and like Trevor Haycock, um, he's from Louisiana, big bird hunter, begged me to go bird hunting with him. I went one time, and we sat in the blinds at Wilson Lake. Never saw a bird. Yeah. Not one. And I'm sitting there looking. I'm like, I hate you guys. Yeah. This is. 15 degrees and it's blowing Yep. and I'm laying in mud. No, yeah. I don't want to do this. And on the way home, I was just all kinds of ticked <laughs> off. So I'm like, I can go kill ducks or geese 
whenever I want at home and it'll take me 30 seconds. Uh -huh. So I, that drove me nuts. But a friend of mine is a, a big bird hunter that lives here in town and he's been begging me to go. So we're going to go try it. Plus I won like, I don't know, 12 dozen decoys or something like that at nice. the waterfowl banquet not too long ago. Cool. And so I was all right, fine, I'll go. It's another thing I can shoot at. So absolutely, we're gonna. It's another thing you can have people pay you to do. I well, mean, technically, they're gonna be. I'm not gonna make very much off of waterfowl. Okay. I'm actually having another outfitter do it for me. Oh. So there's a guy here in town. Um, can't remember what the name of his kennels are, but he's a dog trainer and okay. he does waterfowl stuff. And I got hooked up with him through a mutual friend. He runs the Derby Ducks Unlimited stuff uh wade skeen you know him? i think we went yeah i think he was at the uh um the not trap shooting a sporting clay event up probably at, yeah probably yep. yeah i did think younger um, kid no he's oh, probably no, 35 40 no he's, he's about your age probably yeah maybe um but anyway he's he's the one that i'm having do all that stuff so it's when i bring in guys for waterfowl he takes care of that for me and then i just get like a finder's fee sure but it still hooks people up. Yeah, yeah. He's very, very good at what he does. And it makes them, or gives you some use for the land right. that you wouldn't normally well, have. Well, I mean, we've got, out of that 8,000 acres, there's a bunch of it that's just open fields. Mm. But geese land on them. And if, if there's going to be geese land on them, you might as well shoot them. I, I hate geese from the bottom of my heart. They're terrible <laughs> animals. Where would we be without Canada gooses? Uh, well, the other thing about them is they are absolutely delicious. We I have need, never eaten goose, oh, but I hated eating duck. So duck has to be cooked correctly. Duck, if you let it cool, the fat on duck gets really bad. Not really. It loses its quality really quickly. So you have to eat duck while it's still hot. But duck fat, if you're making sausage and you can't get pork fat, duck fat is great for sausage, believe it or not. Okay. But what I was going to say with geese... We made snow goose pepperoni and snow goose sausage out of, I think, hatch green chili. And both of them, all we did was we took all goose meat and we added 20% pork fat to it. Those two of the best sausages we've ever made here. I mean, they were unbelievably good. That's weird. It was awesome. I want to try, but I don't know if I want to try. Next time you get a ton of goose, we will do it here. Uh, that'll be tomorrow. Oh, okay. Let us know. I was watching like... I don't know, five or six hundred fly over the pond we're hunting tomorrow. Nice. So worst case scenario, I'm going to shoot at something. <laughs> so you basically, there's very few people that wake up in the morning loving what they do. I count myself as one of those very, very few lucky people. You Depends on which day of the week it is. Fair enough. You could, <laughs> you could rate beers and you'd have bad days at your job, you know well, I know you don't drink, but it's the whole waking up and going and installing internet. No, no, there's a lot of mornings I don't really care to do that. Okay, but that's part of what you have to. Yeah, I guess that's how I get payment. to play. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the rest of your job is either going and getting on deer, or which I imagine has got to be awesome, is putting other people. Oh yeah. So it's it's interesting that. I used to be one of those people that was absolutely about, I'm going to go kill a deer. I sat exactly three times solo this year. Yep. And I didn't even sit solo the night I shot my deer. I took a kid that's not a deer hunter. He's a predator hunter. And I made him, the kid that was with us at Concealed Carry, he was oh, in the tree okay. with me because yeah, yeah. he's never deer hunted. And I was like, all right, you're going. And I put him in the tree. Deer comes in. He had never seen a deer that close. He'd never seen big bucks that close shoot the deer and he's just freaking out <laughs> and i'm super calm because i'm like i just liver shot that deer that's not that's yeah, not a good yeah. sign but i'm telling him like yeah man we got him <laughs> i don't know and i'm filming the deer like please fall down please fall down and they laid down softly that's not a good sign we're gonna leave we're, yeah. we're gonna get out of here but um like i've taken something like 14 or 15 different people for their first deer and i'm more pumped when they're shooting than I am when I'm shooting. Yep. Like I get, I get excited. Don't get me wrong. And that's why I still am a child when I shoot a deer, but I've taken them out there and you can see the camera shape. I had to get a camera arm specifically so that I wasn't holding the camera. 
because if I'm holding it, that thing's it's just, shaking. Yeah, Cause yeah. I'm waiting. So, like I'm, I'm ranging. I'm, I'm instructing. I'm waiting. And I'm just like, please make a shot. Please make a shot. Please make a shot. And then as soon as I see the arrow, it's either great. And I am about to jump out of that tree because just, or it's, Oh no. And it's not fun when it's, Oh no. Right. <laughs> Cause then they're like, did I get them? Well, kind of. We've got some work to do. Well, yeah, well, it's going to be a long night. It's the difference between coaching and playing. Yeah, is really what it is. I have a. I live on a pond that's doesn't have a ton of bass, but what's in there is big. Like I have six, seven pounders. There you go. Aren't that uncommon? Um, so when I first moved there, I was fishing every day. You know, and then I kind of just felt I found myself doing it less and less and less. And then we got new neighbors, and they had a, a young kid, maybe a freshman in high school. And he saw me fishing a few times. He's like, hey, can you teach me how? So I'd go fishing with him all the time. And it got to the point where, like, he'd catch a bass. I'd get way more excited than oh, when yeah. I caught a bass. I'm like, that's awesome. Let's take a picture. Send it to your mom. All right, now we're going to weigh it. It's just, it's a different thing when you're doing it for somebody else. Yeah. yeah. I actually got back into fishing this year. Okay. I, I did see that you stocked Bass Pond with catfish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've, we've got different ponds um, and they've got different things in them. We've got a couple ponds that are like bass, crappie, and bluegill just because there's some big bass in that pond. Yeah. Then the other pond also has big bass, but we stocked it with channel cat and crappie and bluegill. And the crappie and the bluegill are just, I can't keep them in there. They eat, they eat them so fast. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be working on that. I may have overstocked the predator fish in that pond, mm, but that no, can be bad. We're going to kill some fish, yeah. but it'll be okay. Yeah. That's how you fix it. But yeah, no, I, uh, I hadn't fished in years. I mean, it, I, I, I'd go once and typically we weren't catching much cause it was always at a bad time, but it was, I feel like I'm going to go Sure. this last year with COVID hitting, I had time for like two months in the spring and I was like, I haven't fished the spawn since I was like in middle school, I'm going. And I caught like 200 and something fish <laughs> in a matter of like a week. Right. And I caught four that were over eight pounds. Nice. I caught something like 15 that were in that like four to six pound range. Yeah. I mean, we were, I was getting into some fish and I, I'm calling my dad like, dude, you need to make time to go catch some fish. That's all. Awesome. Cause my dad loves fish too. And we ended up going, uh, one of the ponds, I've got a picture on my, on my Facebook page with like four bass and there's two of them that are over seven pounds. And then the other two, like the smallest one in that group was like four and a half. And we're just, we caught like 16 that day. It was nuts. And it's, we're standing outside in like insulated clothes. Right. Yeah. Cause it's, it's still cold. cold out. Yeah. If there's something about bass fishing, I mean, I've done just about every type of fishing except for I've never done ocean fly fishing, but everything else I've done. That's a thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Fly fishing in the ocean? on the ocean. Yeah. They do it for like redfish, oh, fish okay. all the time. Um, and it looks like fun, but I've just. I'm not a very good fly fisherman, um, but there's something, and I think it, it's the first type of fishing I really got into is bass fishing. It just connects deeply with, there's mm -hmm. it's so exciting. They fight well. The one thing I wish you guys had, well, two things I wish you guys had down here were smallmouth bass in at least somewhat reasonable numbers. And I miss pike and musky fishing. See, I don't have, we don't have those, but uh, we go to Missouri all the time or used to, I haven't gotten to go for a while, but I'm going to go next year. And we go on the Bryant River okay. and catch smallmouth. Yeah. I love smallmouth. Awesome. Oh, they yeah. They fight like crazy. They just, for the weight they are, it's, I would say, twice as hard as a largemouth. So I caught a, like, almost, it was just under two pounds, I think, smallmouth down there. But I caught him on fly rod. Oh. Because I was being a smart aleck and I was trying to catch goggle eye because we were just slaughtering him. Right. And I caught this, uh, he was about two pounds and that was one of the bigger ones I'd caught down there, but he hit the fly rod and I was like, Oh no, <laughs> here we go. I'm going to burn my hand. <laughs> yep. It's going to happen. Great. And it, that was interesting. I actually, I caught a, a large mouth last year. Um, I guess it's this year, but he was like three and a half, four pounds. And as soon as I hooked up, I was like, made a mistake. This is going to take a while. So I caught a, <laughs> a largemouth on my pond with a fly rod. I had a, uh, I have a couple of uh, bluegill in there, um, decent amount of crappie. The crappie, crappie are really big. Like Good. Really big for that pond. Anyways, but I have a, just a, like a 
little plug frog and have caught like four bass on that thing. I've never caught a bass on frog. Oh, they take it like just never boom, once. and run. It's absolutely awesome. I don't ever catch topwater bass. I, I, I'm doing something wrong. But so the, every time I do it, do can't you, get one. Do you get strikes and, and I don't misses? get strikes half the time. Okay. You probably but I can I can switch to like a uh like a worm, just uh -huh. Texas rig or something, yeah. and get slaughtered. But I'll go to top water, nothing. So the one thing I would say for <laughs> top water, or the one thing I do when I'm fishing top water for bass, I always have another pole with me that has either a worm or or something, some soft plastic. So when they hit and you miss, you immediately put down that pole, grab the other one and throw it. As soon as that thing starts sinking, they will hit it every time. Every time. Literally every time. But uh, yeah, they're catching a large bass on a topwater frog or some sort of topwater lure. There's few things that are the as much, explosion. It just boom and it's gone. There's just the water is gone. All right. So on that deer we were processing here, we got to do some things that were new, you'd never gotten to use one before, the deer lopper. Yeah, that thing is awesome. You were super <laughs> you were super excited when I pulled that out. Um, so it, it's designed to be used to take the hooves off, yeah. but you used it. Tell everybody how you used it. Well, so we didn't get to cut the legs off because, um, is it Mark? Is that his uh, name? Kurt. Kurt. Uh, he ended up cutting just the joints off, so the legs were already gone. So I was like, well, that, I want to use the toy. So skinning the deer down, I get down to the bottom of the neck, or I guess the top of the top neck, of and I'm, you know, cutting down to the bone, and I'm looking for the joint. I was like, well, can we just use those on the head? Well, I don't think it's meant for that, <laughs> but can we do it? Sure. Snap. It was, it was cool. I, uh. Very happy that I have those now. Yeah. So that, we we gave them to you. You have a, no idea how much I'm going to play with those. <laughs> there are so many things I want to try that on. It's like a scene from Dexter. <laughs> so they're, for anyone who hasn't seen them, uh, fully open. They still have a curve in the front. So, I mean, probably you can't get it get it. I bet it's around, like two inches. Yeah, maybe. anything more than two inches. But you also maybe could take them up into your tree stand to trim back some of you those. You could probably do it. They would probably work. It. Oh man, that thing is cool. And, I think and then you, that you, lamb skinner. Yeah. I've already used that yeah, yeah, like yeah. three times. Okay. Wow. I love that. Knife. Nice. That thing is legit. So for anyone who doesn't know, a lamb skinner is a, a curved knife that has some sharpness to it, but it's not the sharpest. It's like knife. a butter knife that's super thin. Yep. But still sharp enough to nick you. Right. Because I did nick my my finger with it, but it was like nick. I. Yep. Yeah scratched it it's not going to cut you deeply and it's real good for getting in between the the skin and the animal without damaging yeah, either cool so that's a, a lamb skinner beef skinner is also good it's just that is slightly also like bigger. nine christmas presents this year <laughs> is that what you're doing when you told me they were like 12 bucks yeah, like i'm expensive. buying a shit ton of those <laughs> and i already did i bought like five of them awesome and i've got that's going to trevor dad uh dalton michael and chase okay and that's just like my hunting buddies right then i have other family and i'm gonna be like you know what i know you hunt you need child go buy one <laughs> uh and then by the time this is out uh we're putting the deer loppers on sale for december uh i think we're taking like 15 bucks off them but those are kind of pricey how much were they with 15 dollars off i think they're 135 <gasps> yeah they're pretty pricey worth it yeah, they are great, though. Worth it. Um, all right. So as someone who has killed yourself upwards of 100 deer, been around all of that, what are your favorite things to do? So my dad is one of those people that likes beef more than deer. So we didn't cook a lot so of he's, deer. He's a normal human being yeah. is what you mean. Yes. Yeah. So we ate a lot of hamburger. Um, but when we did deer, it was either summer sausage or occasionally if we felt froggy, we'd make like jerky. Okay. But otherwise, it was like roasts, and I hate roasts. I, j I just, I've never ate roast and liked it. Yeah. Because it's just dry. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's meat. Yep. Uh, or backstrap steak, and backstrap steak is where we reside as rednecks. That is that is the delicacy. Uh, so, I mean, I everything I make is like the backstrap steaks, and then sometimes we'll make deer burger because... It's fun to change the meat flavor mm -hmm. in like spaghetti or... For sure. Um, we're making uh, enchiladas in like a week. 
Um, cause I've got stupid amount of deer sitting in the freezer right now. It's not even funny, but, um, if you would have just taken quarters, that would have been, I could have brought you all of that. <laughs> we wanted the full deer, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, I stick to the back straps and then, um, I've, I've always had like really crappy charcoal grills. So I've never had like the fancy pellet grills. Right. So now that we have one, oh, you got I get to grill? start playing. Nice. So with charcoal, I couldn't really like measure temperature and all. it was more like the ghetto yep. $15 grills Figure from the seventies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're just like, yeah, it's not burning yet. Seems good. Um, but we've always just like wrapped them in bacon and then glazed them. Well, you gave me an injector. So I'm going to start injecting oh, stuff yeah. and then we're going to start playing with temperatures oh. and pellets and <sighs> injecting your back straps with pause soluble black bull seasoning is it's definitely the best back strap I've ever had. I think Colton said it was the best and he's eaten a ton of deer. Uh, Austin, my boss, does not like to eat deer, but he, he loved got those. On that. Yeah. So, I mean, that is a absolutely awesome way to cook those things yeah i have not gotten to play with a lot of that stuff i am known for my chicken noodle soup uh you can ask london it's, okay it's pretty good uh but yeah we're we're gonna be playing with some deer meat here yep. pretty well, quick. I, mainly because we got so much of it i've got to kill like 15 more does this year too so it's there we got a lot of does gotta go okay but that does kind of tie into one other thing you're set if the food supply chain gets interrupted oh yeah that's an awesome feeling oh yeah like i'm confident in now i may be breaking the law according to the government because eventually i'm not going to be able to get more tags uh, but if push comes to shove we will survive yes yep well <laughs> if we're at that point no one's gonna yeah i don't think anybody's checking tags yep, nope nope that won't be a key uh government but, duty at this point like, so michael the kid that was there the other day uh oh okay. he bought a slingshot off amazon and I, I ended up buying one because this is the greatest little gadget. It fits in my pocket. Okay. I carry this thing everywhere. I carry it at work. Okay. What are you slingshotting? Little like quarter inch ball bearings. Okay. Dude, I can like, I can hit some stuff with this thing. It took me about a week to dial in with it. And I ended up cutting the bands and making it a little stronger because it was kind of weak. I've already killed like 40 or 50 birds with this thing. Because you'll be sitting on top of a house waiting on a radio to boot up. And you're uh -huh. just like, got it. I bet I can hit that bird. It's like 30 <laughs> yards. I bet I can hit that thing. And then you do and you're like, I better get that other yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the installation went great, but there were a lot of dead robins all around. <laughs> I don't know there were feathers all over the yard. <laughs> oh, it's been hilarious. We killed a raccoon with it. Uh, it's like two or three weeks ago. Okay. And that was just like, we had to see if it would do it. Right. And it was 10 yards. He drilled that thing. And we're both just like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, raccoons, one of those things, people have a weird relationship with raccoons and bears. I think they're somehow in the same family. I got raccoons that it's look like grizzly bears. Well, like the hands, people uh, see that and they no, look they're, cute. They're pretty big. Really? Like I, how big? I've got a couple raccoons on camera that are like videos of them walking. Uh -huh. I guarantee these things are like 40 pounds. Wow. Like they are bigger than bobcats what are they and like coyotes. They're freaking huge. What are they eating? All my corn. Wow. I've got a picture of one standing up on its hind legs uh -huh. and it's reaching like a thrower that's probably four feet off the ground. And he's grabbing it. These things are monsters. There's so, a kid from Derby coming to trap for me. Do you have, do you know where that picture is? Uh, it's probably on my computer. Yeah, if you huh? can find it, send it. We'll put it it's, on the video portion of this. It's so stupid. That's insane. Then we had a picture. Uh, I think it's on my dad's computer. We actually had a picture of like raccoons standing with one on their backs so it could reach up. <laughs> they're not stupid. No, they're not. But it was they're just like, not. you guys, I'm going to just start sitting out there and Picking slaughtering you. Yep. Because oh. we're supposed to manage the land. That's my oh. problem with like, my wife was a vegetarian when I met her. Um, then I finally got her to eat chicken. Now I've got her eating steak again. So we're ah, so she's back to not we're being going communist. To, we're going okay. to the right way, um, <laughs> but she has this visceral they're reaction. Cute. Exactly. Like no, they're, they're not. They're not. Like yes, it's cute when you see like someone has a pet and it does something cute. Oh, cute. In the wild, not cute. Destructive. So the house that I moved into for like a couple of weeks when I started this new job. 
I ended up moving in with Dalton because his house is like falling apart. It's my grandpa's old house. Okay. Hadn't been lived in, in like two years. I've killed probably 40 mice out of it. Mm. Like it's, there's a lot to clean up to get it back in shape. I came home one day and I go downstairs. That's where the shower is. And there was a raccoon in the shower. <laughs> at, and it's like you turn on the light down the stairs and the shower's right there. Like okay. You can see the base of the shower from the top of the stairs. Cause it's one of those old style little bitty houses. They conserve space. And I'm just like, why, <laughs> how I caught that thing with a towel <laughs> cause I didn't have anything else. Right. So I went and caught one of my beach towels, got down there and had to like pin this thing to the door frame, reach in with a broom and smack the raccoon like to run into the blanket yeah, and then just drop a V on him. Like you're catching a carp in a river. And then I had to figure out how to get a hold of it right. before it ate me. Yep. And it tried. That oh. We got him out. I ended up shooting that coon in the yard because he was not happy. No. But no, they're mean. Oh yeah. They're mean. That's the thing. Like they have that cute little mask and they kind of, you know, they look cute, but they are not. They are oh, nasty. No, they're not animals. friends. Yeah, nope. But everybody wants to act like they're all right. Sorry. Side <laughs> sidebar. Um kinetic connection outdoors. How are people getting in touch with you? And when's the next time you're accepting hunts? Yeah, so uh, like 90% of what we had come in came through Facebook. Okay. Um, and most of the people, I'm pretty recognizable in my profile pictures. I think right now I'm dressed up in like my 4th of July stuff. It, it, it's noticeable. Okay. Um, but if it's not, actually, no, it's me and a deer that's on there now. But um, it, we're, it's easy to find. And then if you can't find my profile, there's a, a website and a Facebook page. I don't use the Facebook page as much as I should. Um, and I'm going to start posting a bunch of stuff on there to try and kind of make it look like it's active. Yep. Um, but the messages that go on there come straight to me. Um, so I, I still get those too. And then through the website, um, the Wix stuff that I use, whenever you log in there, there's a like a quote request type mm -hmm. thing you can fill that out that comes to me in an email um or you can just call me yeah it was I'm, i usually answer my phone pretty much whenever because at work i'm working by myself and i always have an earwig in so i can just answer most of your questions while i'm working yeah right at the top of kinetic connection outdoors there is a get in touch uh takes you right down to book a hunt so mm -hmm. perfect they can yep. use that and we actually do a lot more than that. So we do shed recovery. We do property management stuff. Okay. Um, we can do property design. There's a lot to it. Um, the in-house taxidermy stuff is actually through Larry. Um, I, I send the shoulder mounts and things to him because I don't have the knowledge to do it yet. Sure. Um, like I know how it's done. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do it. Sure. Um, but like European mounts and all the prep work, I can do all of that. And I take care of that for all my guys that come in. Um, I take care of, you know, meals, transportation, housing, all that. So when you land until you leave, you're mine <laughs> until you decide you don't want to be there anymore. And then you can go home <laughs> or, or until, until it something. runs out. Yeah. 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 Well, but, uh, that's awesome. Uh, we will have you back hopefully next year after, uh, well, no, you, I mean, you're booked, so... Yeah, next year, uh, 2021's booked out. Uh, we've got two TV shows coming hunting, um, and... Ooh, can just, you say which ones? Uh, one of them is 3B Outdoors. Uh, Shane Collins, I believe is the guy's name. I know okay. it's Shane. I can't remember his last name for sure. And then um, I've talked to his boss, or I guess it's boss, maybe it's partner, I'm not sure. And I can't think his name. I've only talked to him once, really. Um, but those two guys are coming down. And I think they're coming in October and then, yeah, first week, October. And then there's another one and I can't remember the name of that one offhand, but they're actually hooked up with like WWE somehow. Okay. Um, and I think they're coming end of November, if I remember right, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, and they're, they're still tentative. I don't know if they're going to go ahead and decide to come, but 3B for sure is coming. And then I'm going to try to get a lot of film next year of everybody's hunts as much as I can. Uh, I've got to get a lot more stands so I can finish putting the second stand in each place. And then once we do that, we're going to try to have everything on film. All right. But you're going to make the rule only 
hanging stands in daylight from now yeah. on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've hung a couple in the dark. It's not not a good time. We've only hung out three times, and each time he's told me a story about how he almost fell out of a stand because he's trying no, to do something at no, night. No, gravity tried to attack me, <laughs> and I had to fend for my life. All right, perfect. Austin, thanks so much for coming. Absolutely. Um, everybody, if you're watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple iTunes, however you're doing it, uh, leave a review. A lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thanks, guys.